Shalom and Racha. Welcome everyone to the Library of Torah Thought. And we want to speak about Shavuos today. And Shavuos is uh, one of the Shalosh Regalim, one of the three legs, uh, one of the three pillars of Judaism. Judaism, uh, of Jewish holidays. Uh, these holidays were very unique because uh, aside from the way that we practice other holidays where we have a special ritual, these were three times where people were commanded to leave their homes and go up to Yerushalayim. Now, it's interesting, Shavuos is an interesting one because the other two holidays, which are Pesach and uh, Sukkot, those were long, either you know, eight days, seven days, depending if you can include Shemini Atzeres, and Chutz Arts, that means outside of Israel, it's an extra day each. But you're getting a good week vacation. So when you think about it, uh, you're, you may live at the other end of Israel. And if you live at the other end of Israel, to get up to Jerusalem could take many days. We have to sort of appreciate, <coughs> appreciate that fact. You know, before there were highways and cars, or even when there were cars, but there weren't proper highways, to get across America took 60 days, 6-0. Six 60 days to get across America. Because there weren't straight highways and you'd end up in little towns and little, little cities that didn't have proper roadway, didn't have proper bridges. So can you imagine, and that was in the 1920s. Can you imagine 3,000 years ago getting across Eretz Yisrael especially if you lived, let's say, up north, and you lived, you know, near Hermon, or you lived in Svat or Tiveria, or any of those places, to get to Yerushalayim was a big, big journey. So if you go for Pesach, Pesach or uh, Sukkot, so okay, but at least I get a week vacation. Imagine Shavuos, two days, a few weeks to go up, a few weeks to go back, the whole thing is two days. It's an interesting thing to think about. And yet, that was one of the mitzvahs that we uh, were privileged to do. Uh, three times a year, we were said, come up, see Hashem. Come up, lachzoz b'noyim Hashem, ulevaker be'cholo, to go and uh, uh, to see the pleasantness of Hashem and to visit uh, His, his uh, dwelling. And this was Besamikdash. Now, in in um, today's uh, environment, we have certain occasions where we can see a lot of enthusiastic Jews. Maybe the prime example is something called the Siyam uh, The Siyam takes place every seven and a half years, where the Jewish people uh, who are learning Dafyomi, Dafyomi was a project that began all the way back in the 1920s, where people would learn a page of Talmud every day, and the whole world would learn the same page, and seven and a half years later, the whole world, or whoever joined the, the project, the program, finished the entire Talmud. And nowadays, uh, there, there's a huge celebration. Of course, when you finish Talmud, that's a big deal. When you finish even one book of Talmud, we make something called a siyum. We, we finish Talmud, and uh, we finish a masachta, and you know, we invite people and we serve good food and we sing and there's a special thing called a hadron where we say, thank you Hashem for uh, giving us Torah. Thank you for us being able to complete it. And now we're gonna go and try to complete it again. Siyam Hashas means that there's the finishing of all the books of the Talmud. And that's a, that's a really rare thing. It's a difficult thing to accomplish. Can you imagine if many, many people do it, many people finish it seven and a half years without missing a day. If they missed a day, they'd have to make up the next day to do two pages, which is very difficult. So there's a big celebration. And the celebration today is often held at places like, um, uh, like the stadium where the Mets play at. And it's, play, and it's in different coliseums around the world. And if you go, to one of the stadiums uh, in New York, you could find close to 100,000 Jewish people together for a few hours 
They say, and it's so inspiring. And, and we, we get inspiration, we take videos, it's music and people, people are just, they're so moved by it. That was nothing compared to Aliyah Laregel. That was nothing compared to how it was three times a year. We're not talking about a hundred thousand. We're talking about millions of people coming up, millions. Not only that, but the women used to come, the kids used to come. They were given special schar to bring up the, the women and the children. So whole families came to Aliyah Laregel. And the inspiration that they got three times a year. We have a Siyam Ajaz once every seven and a half years. This was three times a year. And you looked around and you saw the honor of Hashem. You saw the mightiness of the Jewish people. You saw groups everywhere along the road stopping for picnics on their way up to Yerushalayim and singing songs of thanks to Hashem and, and, and arm in arm dancing with the camaraderie and the achdus that's so Jewish and finally when they made it up to Yerushalayim people say oh I remember you from a few months ago I remember you yeah where are you staying where are you going and the people in Yerushalayim oh did they love it the influx not just the people but of business and this helped support Yerushalayim because people would come and they would have to buy things. And there's even something called Meiser Sheni, which happened on every first, second, uh, fourth and fifth year. That is a special time where 10% of all the money that they earned, they would have to put it aside and spend it during Aliyah Larego. They would have to spend it in Yerushalayim. So let's say the person made 500,000 a year. He's, a, you know, he's doing well for himself. That means he has to come and in one week spend $50,000. Well, you know, you're going to leave the money in your shalim. So he goes to the nicest steak places and to the best entertainment. And it's just the kids love Yerushalayim. It became a thing. So this was Aliyah Laregel. Now Aliyah Laregel uh, on Shavuos was a very short stay. This week, th this, this coming week, Shavuos is what we call a three-day Yom Tov, which means that since Shavuos comes right after Shabbos, so there's no break in between Shabbos, which is Asr B'malacha, forbidden to do work, and Shavuos, which is also Asr B'malacha, forbidden to do work. There's two things that you can do, you can't carry outside, without an Eruv that is mutter, and also uh, you're allowed to cook in certain ways on Yom Tov. But outside of those two things, the laws of Shabbos and Yom Tov are pretty much identical. So therefore, this year is considered a three-day Yom Tov, Shabbos, Shavuos, Shavuos, just back to back to back. And um, personally, I love it. Wow, three days to spend with Hashem, to spend learning and growing. So. I'm, I'm going to break, break down today's talk uh, historically, the mindset, and what the customs are. So historically speaking, what is Shavuos? The Jewish people left Egypt. They left with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Hashem took the Jewish people out through plagues to the Egyptians, through splitting of the sea. It was all... Um, so historic, so dramatic, that today not just Jewish people, but all over the world we speak about it. They make movies, they make cartoons about it. The Jewish people were shown the love, the favoritism. I know that's a dirty word today. It was, we showed the favoritism of God by God saying, I choose you. Come, my dear children, let's take you out of Egypt. I've got a special plan for you. I have something in store for you that's going to change the universe. And we went through the desert and throughout the, our time in the desert, we prepared for an event. And preparing meant that each day we worked on our midos. We worked on our character to be more kind 
to be more gracious, to be more loving, to be more charitable, to be less angry, to be less lazy. We worked on ourselves. We worked on our hakaras hatov, our gratitude to Hashem, trying to understand the different levels and manifestations of Hashem because that's how I come close to Hashem. Who is Hashem who made Makastam, the, the plague of blood? Who is Hashem who made Makas Kinim, the plague of lies? Who is Hashem uh, who during Makas Bechoros chose, em, chose, chose us and didn't choose them? He killed them and he saved us. Who is Hashem who, who allowed us to leave Mitzrayim wealthy beyond our wildest dreams? Who took the army of the great Egypt, the greatest uh, kingdom at that time and utterly decimated it with the crashing down of the waves in the Sea of Reeds. Who is Hashem? And I get closer and closer to Hashem. And through Kabbalah there are also so, sorts of manifestations of Hashem. And we count each day towards Matan Torah. What is today? What is today? Today is number 42. 42. That means that on the 50th day we receive the Torah. That means how many days do we have to, to go? Beginning tonight's going to be 43. Shabbos is going to be number 49. We're going to finish counting on Shabbos. And Motzei Shabbos is day number 50. Now, what is this about 50? Let's get a little esoteric, shall we? What is 50 in Judaism? So 50 is always Ein Sof. 50 is 50 and forever. 50 is 50 and forever. That's why in Hebrew, the word kol, which means everything, kol is numerical value 20 and 30. It's 50. Kol, it's everything. When we speak about the level of tum'ah, the level of impurity that the, that the Jewish people uh, had descended to in Egypt, we say the Jewish people had to be removed, they had to be released from their bondage in Egypt because they were on the 49th level of Tum'ah, the 49th level of impurity. And if they had stayed any longer, they would have hit the 50th and there would have been no recovering, there would have been no Jewish people, we would not have been let out. Why 50? Why not 51? So 50 always means 50 and forever. 50 is the highest, le highest level. I'll explain why in a moment. We say in wisdom, the greatest level of wisdom is when he hit the 50. 50 is 50 and forever. We say Moshe Rabbeinu hit the 49th. There's only one individual who ever hit the 50th. And that was Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva was the only one that got all the way up to number 50. So 50 is 50 and forever. Why is that? Because, it's, I mean, if we're talking about round numbers, if, if Hashem has this thing with round numbers, and there is a, an idea behind them, it's clear, we have minion, it's a round number, it's 10. We have these, we, we, HaKadosh Baruch who works in a certain way. Uh, they say, if you break down the world, the world is created with mathematics. And Torah also mathematics. Mathematics has a holy component to it. A uh, plain mathematician uh, can, it can feel very cold, but it's not. As a matter of fact, if something uh, works out mathematically in science, we almost 100% sure, we say that even if I didn't make such discovery, if mathematically it makes sense, then I will eventually see it in science. So if mathematically gravity is supposed to show up a certain way, through math it shows up, we now can do experiments and we assume that that's how it will come. So the world is created like that. So if, if that's the case and there's some understanding of a round number, so we would say kuf. And we have the notion of a hundred in, in Hebrew. And yet we use 50 as 50 and forever. And the reason why is whenever we think that we've achieved everything, we have to understand that our achievements are only half ours and half God's. Meaning, we need God to be our partner in these achievements. Without Hashem, we're not going to achieve wisdom. And that's why, in Hebrew, the letter Nun is spelled Nun Nun. That's how to spell Nun. If you were to spell out the letter Nun, it would be Nun Nun. There would be no Vav. It would just be Nun Nun. And 
50, and the hidden part is another 50, right? Where you see the outside none, but the inside none is hidden. 50 and 50, half us, half Hashem. So that's a very interesting take on it. We counted 50 days between when we left Egypt and when we received the Torah at Mount Sinai. Now, when we received the Torah, what did we receive? Did we receive all 613 commandments? We did in an innuendo, hidden way, that was more exploded over the next 40 years. One thing that was clear was that we did receive the Ten Commandments. Now they're not really commandments. They are really mission statements. Uh, if you look carefully within the Ten Commandments, you'll find either 12 or 13 commandments, but not 10. So even though people say, the Ten Commandments, that's just from the movie. Really, there were 15 commandments. Very interesting. So, the Ten Commandments, or the Ten Mission Statements, and this is Hashem telling the Jewish people the following. It's Hashem saying, I took you out of Egypt because I have something glorious in mind for you. You're going to be the light unto the nations. You're going to be the role model like we spoke about in the previous class. You are going to show the world that there's a better way. You were slaves in Egypt. Now I'm going to give you Torah. And through that Torah, you're going to change the world. And we know that the world at that time was a decrepit, immoral, wicked, hedonistic place. The rule of the, the, of the, of the, of the jungle is what ruled mankind. Might makes right. If you're strong and you vanquish the, the weak, it is the, it is the order of nature. So people can be abused and women can be abused and human beings can be used as their playthings and it's all all right. And along comes God with a revolution that he gives to a band of slaves and he says, you are going to be my club. You are going to be my firstborn. You're going to be my people. You're going to be my eyes and ears and arm and tongue to the world. And you're going to teach them don't kill people are not entertainment and by the way we think of gladiators but you could think of boxing as well boxing is not a jewish thing it actually is forbidden to smack somebody so you know while i grew up with boxing while i may have grown up you know watching muhammad ali i'm dating myself or later on mike tyson it's not a jewish thing we don't want to see somebody punching someone in the face. It's for that reason that when, when I grew up, my parents didn't allow me to have guns of any sort, even cap guns. A Jew doesn't go around shooting, not even for fun. It's the reason that in Jewish homes, serious homes, we don't, if, if we even allow movies, we don't allow violent movies because all all of that, that is so normalized, blowing people up, shooting. I, I once saw a statistic, and this is an old one. I'm sure it's, it's much worse today, that an average kid who watches movies sees over 30,000 people murdered every year. And I'm not talking about when a plane blows up in a movie. That doesn't count like 300. We're talking about individual people being shot. 30,000 people murdered to an impressionable eight-year-old, watching, absorbing, learning lessons, says Hashem in the Ten Commandments, don't kill. Don't, don't, don't talk about killing. Don't depict killing. Don't depict adultery. If that is what the Torah is trying to teach us, not to murder, so then we don't parade murder in front of our kids or adultery, or taking advantage of people. And yeah, I know that cowboy movies are out, and I know that even some cartoons, which have become very twisted in themselves, are not things we put in front of people, but our lives are precious. And we have these mission statements. The only thing is, it's not cool to be good. It's not cool to do kindness. It doesn't make the news when somebody is thoughtful. However, 
That's what Judaism is coming from. And we were given these commandments, and those commandments changed everything. It changed everything. I want to I I be a little bit crass over here. I lived in certain, certain times in my life, I lived near difficult neighborhoods where there were gangs. And there was gang lingo that filtered in to the neighborhoods where I lived. I lived in Cleveland for a while. I lived in Los Angeles. I lived in Brooklyn. And what is gang lingo? Well, much of it I can't even say on air. It's just, just, it's just inappropriate. But what are they running after? Women that they don't call women. They call them other names. And money and fame. And don't look at me the wrong way. Basically, everything that we're fighting against, everything that we teach our kids is wrong, is promoted. And then that becomes a culture. And then that becomes acceptable to the point that it does infiltrate. So the great gift of Shavuos is HaKadosh Baruch the Almighty said, there's a totally different way to look at the world. Let me give you a mushal. A mushal is a story to help understand the concept. Imagine you were to go onto a planet, and in that planet, there was such a thing called marriage. But the word marriage had nothing to do with love. Marriage was no different than a business partnership. You chose one partner, and then you did what you needed to do. Well, in partnerships, you know, if the person is helping me, okay, I'll play ball with them. You know, maybe together we'll become wealthy. Maybe I'll uh, take on another partner as well. Maybe I'll dump this partner. You know, at the end of the day, we're exhausted and go to sleep, and that's a partnership. And then someone arrives on that planet, and someone says, by the way, you think that marriage is just about a, you know, a, a utilitarian uh, connection with another person, do you know that marriage could involve something called love? Did you know love exists? Did you know that love is a feeling that allows you to forgive when, the, when your partner makes a mistake? Do you know that love can make you so happy that you could burst out into song? Do you know that love means giving of yourself because you care about that other person as le at least as much as you care about yourself, that you'll root for them when they're going through hard times and they're going to be with you during hard times and you'll look back and you'll have memories and you'll have long walks in the park and you'll have your, your ceremonies and your anniversaries and your mementos. Do you know that love exists in partnership? And this person who arrives on the planet teaches a couple and that couple suddenly is so much happier than every other partnership that's out there and the other people who have these marriage partnerships say I don't get it you know we're you know we have a partnership but you guys seem happy as a matter you like you seem like you love your partnership and and they say we don't, we don't love our partnership we love each other and it's not about part we don't even call partnership anymore we are in love and it is the love that we are in that makes us go the extra mile even when it's not convenient, even when it seems like we're taking a loss. It's worth it because it turns out that the goal is not to survive, but the goal is to be in this partnership because this partnership, which is really called love, allows us to grow and have a happy life. So yeah, there's cooking and there's cleaning. Yes, there's the folding of the laundry and bringing home the paycheck and taking out the garbage. Yeah, but it was never about that. It was always about the love. Could you imagine what an eye-opening concept that would be to this alien planet that never looked at partnership as anything but, but something that is, uh, is useful? It's a, it's a useful uh, enterprise to, you know, to not do things by yourself. You know, two are better than one, so let's, you know, let's both 
schlep the suitcase together. No, it could be so much more. It could be so different. This is what Hashem gave us with the Torah. If you look in our tefillah, whenever we speak about giving the Torah, Hashem puts in the word Be'ava. Habaycheres Ama Yisrael Be'ava shows the Jewish people with love. Ava Rabba Avtanu. You showed us so much love. You showed us love. Avas Oilam Be'ezel. Torah Mitzvahs. You gave us Torah Mitzvahs. You showed us love. Torah equals love. The giving of the Torah was the giving of the notion that you could live a life of love. You don't have to live a life where you're just surviving. So you go to elementary school, so you can get to high school, and you survive high school, so you can choose your college, and you survive college, so that you can go post-college, you can get your master's, and then you get your internship, and you're surviving, 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 and in between you're trying to find meaning with your life, so you go on some vacations, buy yourself a nicer car, and the meaning is tough. Hashem says no. Life itself has meaning because life is precious because you're in a relationship with me. And the Torah, this greatest gift of love, so much so that it's the engine in the side, the core of the earth that allows the earth to survive and to thrive and to function and to orbit. The love Hashem gives us gives meaning to the food that we eat to the games that we play, to our marriages, to being parents, to everything that we do. The gift of Torah was the gift of love. We were like, we were like people who lived like robots. We were, we were robots. And part of, that, part of that is when you see a virus, you destroy the virus. And when you see an enemy, you destroy your enemy. And when you see somebody that makes your life inconvenient or does something to you, you take revenge on them. That's what it is. The world lived like animalistic robots. I'm here to survive. Picture, picture cavemen. You know, the stereotypical cavemen. Back when they had almost zero technology. They woke up in the morning and they, they took their stones, they sharpened the edge, and all day long, they're looking for an animal to kill. All day long. Maybe they came home that day, maybe the animal killed them. If they succeeded in killing the animal, they came home, they cut open the animal, they used the skin of the animal to wrap themselves in, they made a fire, the flesh of the animal they ate, and the next morning, they did the exact same thing. And they survived for many years like that. And for what? And it seems so primitive, but it's not that much different than a life without Torah. What makes that different than 2022, a life without Torah? An atheist who doesn't believe in a world of godly love and nobility of spirit and spirituality of meaning and of existence. So what am I? I'm a caveman just with more sophisticated tools. Instead of killing somebody with a, a spear, then we kill someone with a gun. And now I can kill someone's reputation online. But it's all about destroying one person or destroying a group of people. It's all about getting ahead. Comes along the Torah of love. And the Torah of love says, you got it all wrong. You're completely off. And that was the gift. And it's true that in order to live a life of meaning, you have to be a thinker. I have to think. So why did Hashem make me? And what, what am I here for? Am I here to eat? Probably not. Eating is just fuel, it's just energy. Am I here to become wealthy? For what? To buy food? That We just said that's fuel. 
to buy a car, it's to get from here to there. Well, I want a car with a, with a good, uh, good music player, right? I want a good sound system in my car. Okay, so you hear sound. I hope you enjoy your sound. Yeah, but the bass, the bass on the, okay, you'll have good bass on your sound. Where are you going in that car? I'm going to work. To do what? To get money. To do what? To buy a car with a good base system. <laughs> to buy food so I can eat. For what? Oh, to have money so my kids can go to college. So that what? So they can get a good job. So that what? This is serious stuff. There's this quiet desperation that people live with. And they don't even know it. So you know what it causes? Anxiety. It causes depression. It causes sadness. And the more we have, the greater our expectation. Like, okay, I've solved the mystery, the puzzle, and what's supposed to make me happy in my life? And you never did. Nothing did. Nothing worked. Because none of it had intrinsic value. Cars get smashed eventually. Houses break down. Food gets digested and expelled. Life with meaning is precious. And life with love is gold. When Hashem gave us Torah, Hashem gave us the formula to open our eyes, to love our lives, be in a relationship with Him, and to love every moment that we're alive. And we do that through something called mitzvot. And we're going to speak more about mitzvot, um, not next week because it's Shavuos, but Be'ez Hashem, the week after that. But the mitzvot that we do, the mitzvot that we do, they are signposts to remind us not to live lives of nothingness. And so we celebrate Shavuos. We celebrate the fact that we have learned to live a life of love. And this celebration was so accepted by the Jewish people, this understanding of what we were about to get, that when Hashem said, do you want to live a meaningful life with a relationship together with me? In eternity, we said those famous words, Na'asev Nishma. I will do and I will listen. We reversed the order. We didn't say like you would normally say, I will listen and I'll do, because normally you have to listen first, otherwise you don't know what to do. So you say, sure, tell me what to do, and then I'll do it. We were so excited, we reversed the order. We said, sure, I'll do it, tell me what to do. Sure, I'll do it. Other nations of the world called us foolish. They said, silly people, why did you jump and say you would do it without finding out what God wanted you to do? But we weren't foolish. We were so madly in love with the one above. We had meditated on our relationship with Hashem from the moment we left Egypt until now that we were chomping at the bit to get into this marriage. Not a marriage of convenience, not a marriage of utility, but a marriage of love. We couldn't, whatever it took, we were in like Flynn. Whatever it took, we wanted to be part of it. So we said, Nasev and Ishma. And it says in the Gemara that when we said Nasev and Ishma, there were two holy crowns. And the crowns flew down from Shamayim, spiritual crowns. And they adorned every Jewish person. And they adorned them on their heads. Nasev, one crown said Nasev, we will do. One said Nishma, we will listen. And until today, until today, Be'ezrat Hashem, when you have children, we have Rachel here, she can testify, Baruch Hashem, she's got beautiful children. It comes right before Shavuos, and the kids come back. What do they come, sometimes come back home with? What do they have on their heads? They have paper crowns made by the Mora, made by the teacher. Kids come home with crowns, Na'asev Nishma. That's the beautiful crown that our children wear reminding us how badly we want this relationship. Now, Hashem said, in order to be in this relationship, I want you to be excited. And we should have been excited. However, 
We weren't excited enough. And the night before Hashem was to give us the Torah, the Jewish people said, better get a good night's sleep because tomorrow we're getting Torah. Good night, sleep tight. And they fell asleep. And Hashem says, you know, I get it. You want to be awake for tomorrow. But I also think that if you would realize what a big deal tomorrow is, how, you, how the world is about to change forever, and it has, and it truly, honestly has, if you would realize it, it wouldn't be so easy for you to go to sleep. If you were about to receive a mansion in Beverly Hills tomorrow, just like the, the most beautiful mansion overlooking the greatest views that you can imagine, provided you want to live in California. If that's something you're excited about, we'd say, oh, okay, I'm going to sleep 10 o'clock, I'll wake up tomorrow. No, you'd be giddy. You'd be jittery. If the next day you're going to propose and you're hoping that your proposal comes off right, you'd be excited. You're not just going to say, oh, I'm going to sleep. We get excited about things. They don't let us sleep because our minds are racing. So when the Jewish people, the night before the giving of the Torah, went to sleep, it wasn't considered the best thing ever. So the Jewish people have started a custom, and the custom lasts until today. The custom is that the night of Shavuos, we don't go to sleep. We stay up all night. And any community that you're in, wherever you are, you could find shuls, you could find shiurim, you could find classes that you can attend throughout the night. This is, this is a way of atoning for the fact that we just slept through the night before. To the point, by the way, we were so tired the next morning when we went to sleep that Hashem literally woke us up with an alarm clock. It was the chauffeur sound. And everyone got up, oh, today is Jewish day. Let me quickly get up and get in the Torah today. So instead of that happening, the Jewish people, they stay up. And uh, I don't know which communities you live in, but if you're curious, just find your local synagogue. I guarantee you, they've got an all-night program on Shavuos. They usually make it very nice. They've got tons of coffee. They've got lots of cake, lots of nash. Some of them have sushi. You get up, you stay up. You make chivrusas all night, learning, learning partners all night long that you could sit and learn Torah. And usually the tefillah the next morning begins at the earliest possible time. So we don't keep people up. We don't have a regular davening at 8.30 or 9 o'clock in the morning. Instead, we daven the earliest possible time. I have to check this year what time that is. But, you know, you're talking about hours earlier, maybe 6, 6.30 we start davening. So people are up. So the meal is over. The meal starts late. It's uh, late summer. And uh, you'll finish the meal around 11, 11.30. And then you trudge off to shul. Or if you can't, you come at home. You get your books prepared, you can read a book, you can read Torah, you can read a biography of a tzaddik, whatever it is, you prepare your material, you get your coffee ready, you roll up your sleeves, and tonight's a night of learning Torah all night. And that's what we do, that's what we've done for many, many hundreds of years. Next, there is a custom on Shavuos, and the custom is to eat cheese. Cheese. Why do we eat cheese? We eat cheese because one of the names of Har Sinai is Har Gavnunim. It was one of the names, and in order to remember the uh, Har Sinai, Mount Sinai, uh, we eat cheese because cheese in Hebrew is Gavina, which uh, comes to the same root word of, uh, as Gavnunim. So we eat cheese, and therefore the custom has become, has turned into eating cheesecake. So therefore, cheesecake is the food of the day. So get yourself lots of cheesecake. Shavuos is the day for cheesecake. All sorts of blueberry and caramel. Now if you come to the Klatsko house, you'll have cheesecake every Shabbos. That's cheesecake and cheese. And some people even eat uh, a dairy meal on Shavuos. Next thing, next custom is on Shavuos, there's a custom to buy beautiful flowers for the home. 
It is the Mother's Day of Judaism. We go out and buy flowers. Why do we buy flowers? Because when Hashem gave the Torah at Mount Sinai, in order to make it on a mountain that was beautiful, because remember, Sinai is in the middle of a desert, it's what we call the Sinai Desert. So in order to make the mountain beautiful, Hashem made a miracle and the mountain bloomed with beautiful flowers. Just like if you're having a wedding, you want beautiful flowers, it should be in a beautiful and respectable place. So Mount Sinai was full of flowers. And therefore our custom is we buy beautiful flowers and therefore people who sell flowers in the Jewish community, the biggest day for selling flowers is the day before Shavuos. That is the day when everyone goes out and they buy gorgeous flowers. And if you even go to your local shul, many local shuls will have flowers adorning the Holy Ark. So if you go to the Ark and they read the Torah on Shavuos, you'll see flowers all along the Aron Kodesh, beautiful flowers, it's gorgeous and we don't cheap out, we don't do it, oh, well we have flowers for a wedding. Guess what? This was considered a wedding. We were getting married to Hashem and because of that we had beautiful flowers and that was another thing that we have on Shavuos. These are customs that we have on Shavuos. Another thing that we read on Shavuos is we read the Megillah of Rus. Megillah of Rus. You know there are five Megillahs. The famous one we know is the Megillah's Esther. That's right on Purim. But there really are five and one of the Megillahs is called Megillahs Rus. It's the shortest one. It's a very poignant story. One of my favorite stories in all of the Torah. It's about a young Moabite princess who ended up converting to Judaism of her own free will. Her husband died and she said, oh, may should I just go back to Moab and continue being a princess? Or should I follow my mother-in-law even though my my husband has passed away. Should I follow my mother-in-law back to Israel where she's a widow, I'll be impoverished, I'll have no money. And she said those famous words, Amech Ami, my nation is your nation. She says to her mother-in-law, I choose Judaism. Elokaich Elokoi, my God is your God. Where you go, I go. Where you lay, I will lay. Whatever you do, I will do. That's what Ruth said. And she became one of the great converts in all of Judaism. And from this convert, she ended up marrying a man named Boaz, a man who was much older. But she married him because of a law called Yibum. He was a relative. And when a person's husband passes away he, she, and there's no children, there's a mitzvah for the widow to marry the closest relative. And the closest relative was somebody named Boaz. And she married him even though he was much older. It was a kindness on her part. And he died. Boaz died right afterwards, the next day. But that night that they were able to consummate, she was impregnated and she had a child. And they had a child, and they had a child, and the fourth generation had David HaMelech, King David. So King David came from a convert. David HaMelech came from Rus. And who came, who's going to come from David HaMelech? Who one day is going to come and redeem the Jewish people? Mashiach. And Mashiach came from King David, who came from Rus. So why do we read this on Shavuos? Major, two major reasons. Number one, when the Jewish people stood at Mount Sinai, we actually converted. We were converts. What does that mean, we converted? We were. Avram wasn't Jewish, Yitzchak wasn't Jewish, Yaakov weren't. They were the Avos, they were the forefathers of the Jews. In order to convert, you need three things to convert if you're a male and two if you're a female. If you're a male, you need to get circumcised, you need to go into the water, mikvah, and you need to accept the Torah. When the Jewish people left Egypt, 
one of the first commandments was, even before, circumcise themselves. So they did that, number one. Then when they went into the sea, before it split, they were covered with water. That was mikvah, that's number two. And then when they stood at Mount Sinai, they, what did they do? They accepted Torah, that was number three. So therefore, the Jewish people were legitimate converts. We all converted. So we read Rus, which is a story of a convert. It's so beautiful. But another reason that we read, that, that we read Rus is because David HaMelech was born on Shavuos. David HaMelech also died on Shavuos. Great tzaddikim are born and die on the same day. Who else was like that? Moshe Rabbeinu lived exactly 120 years exactly. Like it says in the Torah, Ben Meya Ve'es, uh, Ben Meya Ve'es, I am 120 today. It was his birthday. Great Sadikim have their days full. Days full means that they born and they die on the same day, so they complete their years. David HaMelech was especially unique. And this is the third reason why we read Rus. Especially unique. Because many years before, there was a person who was created named Adam. Adam. And Adam was the first humanoid, human person that was made. He was made with an neshama and he was meant to live forever. But then after he ate from the eight sadas, so then Hashem said, you're going to live 1,000 years. A thousand years is a lot of time. I don't expect to live a thousand years. Hashem then showed Adam Arishon through prophecy some great neshamas that are going to be born to him. And this gave Adam Arishon comfort, even though he's not going to live forever, but there are going to be great souls that come from him, great tzaddikim. And he's watching in this Navu and this vision, these great tzaddikim, and all of a sudden he sees one neshama that comes to the world and then leaves the world instantly. So Adam says to Hashem, stop, one second, who was that? What a neshama, wow, but one second, this great neshama is going to come to the world and live and die and, and the same day? What, they're, they're going to die at childbirth? Hashem said, yeah. Hashem said, yeah. That's this neshama. And other Rish said, it can't be. It can't be. The world needs that offspring of mine. How long is the typical lifespan of people in those days? And Hashem says, it's 70 years that David HaMelech mentions our lives are 70 years. And if we're extra strong, 80 years. So Adam Arishon said, this neshama that's going to come from me cannot be a stillborn, can't live and die on the same day. So I want to donate 70 years of my life to this neshama. And this neshama ended up being called Davon HaMelech, King David. And Adam Arishon, Adam, ended up living instead of a thousand years. If you look in the Torah, he lived 930 years, exactly. And King David lived exactly 70 years. So why do we read it? Because on Shavuos, we accepted the Torah and when we accepted the Torah, our rabbis teach us that we became so holy in that moment, we were like, and I'm going to tell you the Hebrew and the English, we were like Adam Arishon, Kodem Achet. We became like Adam before he ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Before he transgressed the commandment of not to eat from the tree of knowledge, he was supposed to live forever. And so on Shavuos, where we 
for a moment until we worship the golden calf, then we messed everything up again. But for a moment in time, we got back to that place. And it's because uh, of that, with this chus of King David, that uh, we remember Adam Arishon, and it's a special kapara for what Adam Arishon, special atonement for what Adam Arishon had done. So many deep ideas behind Shavuos. I'm going to finish, I'm going to finish with this. Every holiday is unique. Every holiday is special. And every holiday has its special commandments. And those commandments are in the Torah. So on Sukkot, we have a commandment to sit in the sukkah. We have a commandment to shake the four species. A lulav and eser, kadasim and aravos. On Pesach, we have a mitzvah. Eat matzah, eat marah, don't eat chametz. On Yom Kippur, we have a, we have a mitzvah. Don't, fa uh, don't eat, you have to fast. There are other things that we do on Yom Kippur. On Rosh Hashanah, blow shofar. Every, every holiday has its thing. Interestingly enough, on Shavuos, there's no special commandment in the Torah. What I told you earlier about the flowers and the cheesecake and staying up all night, those are called minhagim, those are customs. And we do them and we cherish them, we love them, but they're not mitzvahs in the Torah. Why is it that the very day that we're accepting the Torah, Hashem doesn't give us a special mitzvah in the Torah? It must be that we're supposed to be focusing all of our attention on the mitzvah of learning Torah itself. The Torah is the mitzvah. Learning Torah, appreciating Torah, absorbing the words of Torah in our bones to the point that it becomes the priority in our life. It becomes something that we speak about at every meal and on the road. When you go to sleep, when you get up, Torah surrounds us. Torah is love. Torah is the love song of Hashem to the Jewish people. It's so sweet. It's so beautiful. Unfortunately, so many in Judaism are lost. And they don't get this. So to them, Torah is tikkun olam, fixing the world. It does fix the world, but that's not Torah. Torah is love. Torah is love of Hashem. Love of the life that Hashem has given us. Meaning in the life that Hashem loves us in and wants us to produce and to, and to find meaning in the day to day, into the mundane, so we don't live lives like a rat on that wheel, just running, running, running until it's too exhausted and he drops dead. That's the Ava Rabba Avtanu. You gave us just Ava Rabba, not just love, but great love. You became our father, you became our lover, you became our king. So I hope you all have a beautiful Shavuos. Appreciate the gift of love that is Torah. And on a practical level, if you don't own an art scroll chumash in your home, you should buy one. It's the best chumash out there. It's an art scroll chumash. You got the translation. You've got a very, very good explanation on the bottom. Make it your reading material. It will become that way eventually anyways. You get older, you get curious. Why not now? And even more so, if you're so madly in love with this opportunity to learn Torah, then consider, if you've never done it, the concept of yeshiva or seminary, where all day long you get to explore and plummet the depths of Torah and its wisdom and its meaning and its relevance and its purpose. That's what it's for. And these institutions exist and they're so valuable, they're so worthwhile that uh, they should be part of your life goal, part of your life mission for you to go, for your children to go so that you can le learn how to live a life of love and meaning through Torah. Thank you. Chag Sameach everyone.